Tonight we are delighted to have Joyce Prince relate to us the story of Mary Chilton, a Mayflower survivor. Next year, I know you all know that we will be marking the 400th anniversary of the Pilgrims landing at Plymouth. There's going to be um, many, many uh, productions and celebrations in the year to come, so Tales of Cape Cod is getting a head start. So our speaker, Joyce Prince, has a BA and an MA from the University of Massachusetts Amherst and did her graduate studies at the International Institute in Madrid, Spain. She has 30 years of teaching experience from the elementary to college level, and she has presented talks at many national conferences and in Mexico, Spain, and Puerto Rico. Joyce is an author and a member of the Society of Children's Books Writers and Illustrators. And I would like to welcome to our podium Yarmouth Port resident, Joyce Prince. Thank you. I don't like mics, but hopefully everybody can hear me. Yes. Good. Well, I always get nervous, and now that I'm here, I think my nervousness will disappear slightly. But I am not one of these nice, quiet little uh, speakers. I like to look at my audience, and that sometimes makes me feel much more at ease. And thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, it is very gratifying to see such a nice group of people. Tonight, I would like to give you a little glimpse, because there isn't much written, and you have to kind of take a lot of the different accounts and come up with what you think, at least in your opinion, is the best thing that you can do. So anyway, it is my pleasure to present a glimpse of James Chilton, 63 years old, Mrs. Chilton, we never hear her first name, and then Mary Chilton, who was only 13 years old. Uh, she became Mrs. John Winslow later on. I'd like to also mention a few highlights of the Mayflower voyage and a few highlights of Plymouth settlement. But you know, in 45 minutes, you can't really cover everything, so I'm trying to hit the high points. Uh, Mary Chilton Winslow certainly, along with many of the pilgrims, did leave a legacy behind. And there were 35 uh, voyagers, passengers, and they came along with one third of that group was probably under 21 years old. So that's a large group of young people. And Mary Chilton, of course, was among them. Uh, during the first winter, Mary Chilton's mother died and so here we have now Mary, an orphan. How was it that she survived then, this voyage, her time in Plymouth, and also when she ended up moving uh, to Boston? So I will do my best to give you a good story about Mary Chilton Winslow. Now, you cannot just sit back and do nothing. You have to participate. So, we now have a title, so we know Mary Chilton Winslow, survivor of the Mayflower Voyage. And hopefully I do this right. Good. <laughs> this is the next slide, but you have to now go back in history. This is the cover of the book that my daughter did the illustration for. And if I get this right, that's supposed to be Mary Chilton, and this, of course, is the tiny little Plymouth Rock. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to please think back now to the time when now we have James Chilton, Mrs. Chilton, and Mary Chilton waving goodbye to the two young women who are left behind, Isabel, Chilton, and also Angle Chilton. 
They're left behind. I don't know why. I never found out. Haven't, maybe one of these days I will. But so far, I know nothing about that. Why did James Chilton, 63 years old, risk his life to go to the New World? Why in the world did he say to his wife, hey, you better come with me or you're going to be left behind? And Mary, she doesn't have a choice. She's 13 years old. She goes where the parents go. Well, life has become very difficult in England. Uh, these people that wanted to worship as they could, could not. And so they said, well, we are going to have to do something about this. These Puritans were Protestants who wanted to reform the church. They wanted to do away with a lot of the falderal, as they would say it, of the Anglican church. They called it a catch of popery and of corruption. And what happened if you did not agree? Well, the dissenters were really treated very, very badly. Either they were killed or they were tortured. Uh, they might be banished. They might have uh, some of their limbs cut off. They might have their head stuck up on a pike. Uh, this was not a good time. And where they talk, what is it, quarter? What do they call that, quarter? Yes, that was very, very popular um, at the time. <laughs> you didn't want to be caught in that. A lot of torture also. Well, all of a sudden, here comes the Savior, they think. King James is coming out of Presbyterian Scotland. And there's these uh, dissenters, the separatists are saying, oh, here comes King James. He's riding in on a white horse and he's going to save us all. Unfortunately, that is not what happened. The Church of the King became the Church of the Nation. Boy, all of a sudden I am dry as anything. Let's see, I got nervous already. So excuse me while I take a swig here and so forth. The uh, separatists were against, actually, the aristocratic principles. And, of course, he represents the aristocracy. The um, nobles and gentlemen said, you know what? You have to believe what we are telling you. You're of the lower class. You can't think for yourself. We don't care about Simon the Saddler or Billy the Bellows Maker or Tommy the... Smith or whatever he was, you have to believe what we tell you. And it was dangerous if you didn't agree because the doctrine of the divine right of kings was in existence. Uh, there were different class distinctions, and I mentioned the nobles, the gentlemen, below that were the citizens, and then the yeomen. And then below the yeomen were the petty merchants, and then below them were the ones who couldn't work, either physically or mentally, unfit, or mercenaries, crooks, and so forth. So, of course, that would all determine what kind of a life you had. Uh, James Chilton belonged to the citizen class, which meant that he either could sit in the lower house of Parliament, and he also could vote. His father actually had quite a bit of land and money, and then James Chilton became a freeman uh, by the mayor of Canterbury. And at that time, that was a quite a interesting item, I guess you would call it, because the mayor was only allowed to make one freeman a year at that point. Um, so I have to, what about the women? <laughs> they don't exist as a social class. They are a non-entity, believe it or not. I didn't like that when I read that. <laughs> but anyway, we're moving along now. And this so, uh, shows Scrooby. But actually, before 
the congregation, this particular congregation, went to Scrooby, they were in Sandwich. And about uh, 1600, James Chiltern and his family went to Sandwich. And Mary was baptized there in uh, 1607, I believe it was. So she isn't very old. They think, maybe, that uh, James Chilton might have met some people who later became part of the Scrooby congregation who then later went to Holland. So that is one of the um, stories that maybe Moses Fletcher and several other people might have been there. So Sandwich, before Scrooby, was becoming a center of um, religious uh, separatist activity. So on many Sundays, we're having James Chilton and his family and friends attending uh, the Scrooby Congregation Church. But, of course, they didn't attend King James's church. So, they're worshiping at night, and they're sneaking around, going to other houses, and trying to uh, make sure that um, the um, king's men don't find them. But I have to regress a little bit here, because now this is John Robinson, who was in charge of uh, the Scrooby congregation. And so, in 1615, which is later, but I have to mention that, he goes, when they go to um, Leiden, he becomes a member of the university. And he graduated from college from Cambridge, England, and then later on he petitioned in 1615 the University of Leiden to become a member, which meant that he could then debate topics uh, he could attend lectures, and he would be learning a lot about the Arminians, who were another group, but they were a little bit more active and a little more violent. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, later. So now, as I mentioned, King James is trying to find out what's what. So what does he do? Sends out all these soldiers. And it was frightening times. People knew they were illegal, but that really didn't stop them. For some were taken and clapped into prison. Others had their houses beset and watched night and day and hardly escaped their persecutors' hands. And most were fain to flee and leave their houses, habitations, and even the way they earned their living. That comes from George Willison's book, Saints and Strangers. Well, Mrs. Chilton becomes excommunicated because she and two other, she was a woman, but two men, they were excommunicated because they wanted to bury this child by the name of Andrew Sharp. And that occurred in 16. Oh, 09. And of course, the Archdeacon Report says, Mrs. Chilton, you know you are not obeying church law or English law. And you may be arrested and you may be thrown into prison. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Chilton didn't go for that, but they were still very, very concerned about having religious freedom. The pilgrims saw themselves at that time uh, on a divine mission. They hoped to create a heaven on earth. Oh, excuse me. They also believed they were a chosen people. Well, again, I'm still showing my king soldiers here. If you wanted to leave England, you could not do so without the permission of the king. Um, and there was some very interesting information about that. At one point, the king said, oh, I don't care, you know, they can leave all they want. All of a sudden, they decide, he and the judges, 
This isn't good. We have all these citizen people leaving. We got all these young men leaving, and things are getting a little scary. So, of course, what did they do? They approached a lot of people and said, "Hey, what's your neighbor doing? You know, are they selling off their goods? What are, what are they doing? Are they, you know, sneaking around or what?" So, somebody who might have been your friend one day, maybe tomorrow. Is going to turn you in, so it was very, very frightening time. Women and the children were even put in prison. The men were put in prison, and I don't know how many times that happened because I lost track. That it's really not important, but they were in and out and in and out of prison. Finally, the men said, "You know what? This has gone on long enough." They wanted to make their way to Holland, and it took many months. And for some many years before they were able to get their families together, well, Holland was not very far away, and there was freedom of worship, and the Dutch welcomed foreigners. Well, now we're going to go here with the Chiltons and other families going along to Leiden. It took them from 1609. To 1615, before the group was actually together again and was able to worship.、Um, as a quick aside, when the women were going back and forth to the prisons and out, some of the ladies in the community, because what did they do? They paraded them down the street and said, "No, hey, take a look at this. You know, these people are getting out of prison. The women, the children, and you know, it was like." Something to、uh, enjoy, you know, like、uh, entertainment. But then some of the women in the group of the community felt sorry for the women and the children who were sometimes without food, sometimes without clothing. They say, "Oh, go back where you came from. Well, you have no house left. So how are you going to go back there?" So they, these women, would take them in because they felt. Uh, empathy uh, for the、uh, people. So anyway, here we are, and it's not difficult, really. I kind of hinted at it before. The men would make the decision. Okay, we're picking up and we're moving, and the women, no choice, and they were told, okay, we're here. You have to set up a household and something. Many, many times the resources were extremely、um, few, so it took a lot of patience and a lot of courage for these women to go along with this. And what, when they left, what did they do? They had to leave all their friends. They had to leave their furniture. They had to leave practically everything. I mean, I can't imagine picking up. Like even nowadays, we know what's happening. A lot of people have no home and something, and to have this group of people, no place to go, really. But anyway, stand fast because this is what happened, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why the Plymouth settlement ended up to be successful was because the women. And the men really had to work together here. Stand fast, one spirit and one mind striving together. And I think that was probably one of the most important factors in the success of the Pilgrim Colony. So now we are coming to Leiden. Doesn't that look like a beautiful place? How many have been to Leiden? Anybody? Oh, I'd like to see that. I have not, unfortunately. Anyway, we have in 1609, the Pilgrims arrived in Leiden, and Leiden became the city of the refugees, and the Protestant migrants were welcome. The city granted on February 12th permission for the Pilgrims to enter Leiden. Leiden refuses no honest people. Free entry to come live in the city, as long as they obey all laws and ordinances, and under those conditions, 
the applicant's arrival would be pleasing and welcome. Finally in Leiden, they removed to Leiden, a fair and beautiful city and a sweet situation, but made more famous by the universities. Oops, sorry about that. Wherewith it is adorned. So now we're moving along, and this is the convoluted area called Peterskirk. And this is where the Scrooby Company ended up. And if I can do this right, somewhere in here was James Chilton's home, along with William Brewster and John Robinson and a number of others. Now, James Chilton was fortunate because he was a tailor, and the Dutch people liked and appreciated fine clothing and fine fabrics. So they think that James, I almost said James Taylor, <laughs> James, <laughs> Chilton, <laughs> James Chilton had um, probably not only a one-room house, but two, because he would have been able to carry on his uh, tailoring in another area uh, of the house. But you see how convoluted that area is? And they, where did they live? You've probably heard this before. Stink Steeg Alley. Just what it sounds like, Stink Alley. Because all of the odors and fumes and so forth would stay in the area. There was no place for them to dissipate. So that's what they put up with. They also didn't know the language. And where are the good jobs? Well, all of this was very, very difficult. And John Robinson and three other separatist men bought uh, a large house, again, somewhere in here, called Green Port. And they had a uh, few families there. And then they had 12 different little cottages, one-room cottages for other people to live in. They are living in poverty. If it hadn't been for some of the Scrooby congregation who was better, well off, they would not have survived. They are living where the children are working night and day in the shops, in the textile factories and so forth. And they're becoming like little bent over people. I mean, it's hard to imagine. Children cannot be children. They cannot go out and play. They are there every day, morning to night, working with the women and the fathers, uh, mother, parents, or whatever. So it was difficult to get around. The first mention of the children family is in 1615, when Isabel Chilton married Roger Chandler. July 2nd. Now, Engel, the other sister that I told you, there were two sisters left. Engel was married later to Robert Nelson. <laughs> For a long time, I didn't find any information. It's like Engel whoosh, drops off the grid. She's lost. Lo and behold, about six weeks ago, I said, I found out more information about her. She's only been married three times. <laughs> the, the first husband that lasted from 1615, no, 1622. The second husband, 1636. And he's Daniel, and heaven help me, I tried to pronounce this name. Anybody know Dutch? Anyway, it is P I E T E N S Z. Somebody give it a try. <laughs> That's one of them. And then one year later, I haven't yet found out what happened to the second husband. I'm looking. I'm trying to find that out. But the third husband is Matthew Tillagem. And that was almost a year to the day after the second husband. So I don't know what happened to him. But anyway. But now life is getting a little better here in Leiden. And before I go to my next slide, 
mention that now, uh, this was the time of the 12-year truce between Spain and the Netherlands. Very, very interesting point. The Dutch needed some strong arm to help kind of stave off the Spanish and say, hey, don't mess with us because we got some power here. So they went to King James and said, hey, King James, how about helping us out a bit? King James says, sure, I'll help you out, but I want to say in the Dutch government, I want to be able to discuss any of the theology questions of the day. Most importantly, I want those pilgrims out of Holland. Well, the Dutch said, no way. We'll do all those other things. We'll, you know, we'll accept your help. You can talk about the government, whatever. We are not going to throw the pilgrims out. They are contributing to society. If they borrow money, they pay it back. They're working in all kinds of professions and trades, and they are contributing. So the other thing was that British citizens, if they relinquished um, their citizenship, they could belong to a guild, and the guild would offer better jobs, better opportunities, economic opportunities. And remember I told you, these people in this Scrooby congregation, they're living in poverty or on the edge of poverty. So William Brewster says, you know what? It's worth it. So he became a member of the guild, and then he was able to have uh, other Scrooby members of the congregation work for him. Now, James Chilton, here, this is now 1619, April or so. Things are changing. The laws now are changing. The law says now there can be no uh, non-conformist marriages. You cannot give the poor any money. And what was the other thing they, they said? Oh, you can't have any more meetings. Well, this was on the books, but they really weren't uh, probably enforcing it yet. But it's to the point where this Scrooby congregation is beginning to see the hand writing on the wall. So anyway, this incident, James Chilton's walking along with his daughter, and he gets hit in the head. Probably most of you know the story. He got hit in the head with a stone. Um, and so he had to go to the surgeon um, in the town. And after this has happened, the Armenians now, remember, they're, they're another nonconformist group, but they're a little bit more active. They go to James Chilton and his daughter and they say, you know what, we're sick and tired of being blamed for everything bad that happens in Leiden. So, would you go and in front of the judge or wherever you have to go and uh, give a deposition about what happened here. So that's what Isabel and her father did. 1984, Jeremy Banks, who is an author and well known on Leiden and the Pilgrims, finds in the archives a document that proves that James Chilton was a separatist, and he lived in Leiden. There are many, many books written saying that James Chilton was you know, a stranger, and he was not a member of the Scrooby congregation. So in 1984, that is disproved. So anyway, we move on here a little bit. And now we have to leave Leiden. We don't like what's going on. Changes are occurring. Uh, again, Jeremy Banks says he thinks that why a lot of people left was because they couldn't um, enlarge the congregation because they didn't know the language well enough. I don't know as I really buy that. Um, one of the choices that the people made here was the children now are 
a lot of teenagers, right? They've been here for a while, and now all of a sudden, uh, they are becoming what uh, I read somewhere, and I love the term, Dutchification. So, <laughs> as time went on, the separatist children wanted to belong somewhere. And, you know, the Dutch people were fun-loving, and they liked to enjoy themselves on the Sabbath. So we had a number of uh, young people now who are teenagers. The boys want to join the army, go to sea. They're marrying um, some of the Dutch uh, girls and, and so forth. So Robinson's congregation is saying, you know what, if we're going to make it and we're going to stay together and we're going to survive, we're going to have to get out of here because the kids are becoming like little Dutch ones. And so that's why they uh, wanted to uh, leave. The Scrooby congregation does drop out of sight uh, for a few years. Now, I know some of you will probably say, well, what's that got to do with Mary Chilton? Well, I have to interject to you. You can't talk about Mary Chilton without knowing a lot of these other things. There's very, there are very few documents about it. So I do the best I can with the information uh, that I have. So I hope you'll uh, bear with me uh, on that. Many parents left their daughters behind. Some of the women got left behind. The thinking was, and you're not going to like it, <laughs> it would say the women were considered to be the weaker vessels, not as strong physically, mentally, or emotionally stable as the men. But of course, we know differently because who is it that survived and helped that uh, settlement grow? It was the women. And Mary Chilton, when she got older, she was in that group also. So here we have now the pilgrims left Leiden in 1620. William Bradford described their departure with these words, so that they left that goodly and pleasant city which had been their resting place near 12 years. But they knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lift up their eyes to the heavens, their dearest country, and quieted their spirits. So we come now, and I have a little replica of the Mayflower over here. Now, on this Mayflower and this little ship here <laughs> will give you an idea. We have 102 people. And I asked Pete how long this was, and he said approximately 35 feet, is that correct, from here to where he is. We have a, more people than you are, 102, stuck in a space 58 feet long and 24 feet wide. Smelly, I mean, all kinds of vermin. You, below you, you have the animals you brought with you and so forth. Dark, water dripping periodically where you are. Um, not, a, not a cruise ship, that is for certain. <laughs> and then, of course, we find out that on Wednesday, the 6th of September, the wind coming east-northeast, a fine gale, we loosed from Plymouth, having been kindly entertained and courteously used. So this voyage begins. You've got these 102 people on this boat. They're stuck in this small space. They were 66 days and they traveled almost 3,000 miles, 2,700 miles, cooped up in here. Now some people say, oh well, they could go up on uh, deck. You could not go up on deck if you got 30 people, crew members, working up there. If you were lucky, some of the men got to clock some of the seams so the water didn't come dripping down on you. But basically, you were stuck underneath dark, smelly, and whatever. So Mary Chilton and these five or so older girls have to end up trying to keep the kids calm, watch the kids, because everybody else is seasick. Uh, you know, they're, they're not managing... Uh, 
very well at all. And, as I said, this is no cruise ship, no bathrooms, okay? A bucket that you're going to use for hopefully a clean one for the water and one for the other stuff, uh, whatever waste there was. And you better know which way you're going to throw it out when you, uh, right? Otherwise, you might end up with a face full of something you didn't want. So. <laughs> The dangers of crossing, of course, the ocean uh, were vast, too. You're out here in the middle of nowhere uh, at all. Uh, I mentioned about the seasickness, uh, the day-to-day -day kind of things that happen. Disease, terra incognita, unknown land, cannibals out there. And in the corners of the maps would show these ugly, funny-looking creatures with tails and animal heads and pot human and so forth. So nobody wanted to share anything. You know, they're afraid that you're going to, somebody's going to get a little ahead of you. So you would not tell anybody about maybe what was um, happening. Well, we have Captain Jones here of the Mayflower. He was uh, from a, a maritime family, marine family. And his dad had left him when he was 18 years old, a ship. I uh, sold that, and then he bought another one called uh, the Josiah. And he sold that one, and then in um, 1609, somewhere in there, eight, he and two other fellows bought the Mayflower. And then when he was 50 years old, with a few years later, he was commissioned to um, go to the New World and bring the pilgrims. Well, I better move along here. I'll never get to the end of my story with Mary Chilton. Um, I started in um, the time when the Red Sox were, they didn't do too well this year, but anyway, they were going to spring training, and they were talking about the provisions. They're going to bring 60 cases of sunflower seeds and 60 cases of gum and how many balls and all that. And I thought, gee, what did the pilgrims bring with them? You know, what kind of a list did they have? Supposedly, they used Captain John Smith's uh, list. But 2012, guess what happened? Jeremy Banks, Caleb Johnson, a scholar, and Simon Neal found in the Mayflower um, archives an old document that was uh, a suggested list, whoops, a suggested list from the uh, merchant adventurers. And that's what they mentioned about the hard tap and um, butter, good cheese, oats, peas, rice, and so forth. And remember now, we said this is getting to be a little bit uh, monotonous here. And uh, let me see. The next one here, I'll just quickly show you the Mayflower, which was on the uh, ship and supposedly was painted so that people could see what it was like from a distance. And then we have this mammoth cap. And this was one of the clothing that was most everybody had, the sailors had it and so forth. The mammoth cap, a knitted woolen cap worn by soldiers and civilians in the 16th century, was produced here and elsewhere as an important cottage industry. So we move along here. Now Mary is on board with a number of people, and one of the things that they had to get used to was every day the same old thing, same routine, same food salt um, horse, which was dried beef, fish, or pork. Hard tack. All I can even think of is Zweibach, or whatever it is, that biscuit thing. That's even worse than that, they tell me. <laughs> and anyway, um, after a while, Mary, of course, is used to being clean. She can't wash her clothes, can't wash up very well. So the clothes are getting full of lice and vermin and all like that, not a good thing. Um, two dogs were brought on board, which broke up the monotony. That's a mastiff, and he was brought on for protection by John Goodman. 
and then a spaniel was brought uh, for hunting for wherever they got wherever they were. So Mary now, as we mentioned, has to tend the sick and so forth. Now the pilgrims had hoped they would be able to learn how to read the children, but remember I told you they had to work from morning to night, so they really didn't have much chance. Uh, John Alden was brought on board here also to take care of the barrels because the barrels were necessary for good food and water. How did they pass the time? Well, the Geneva Bible, and I'm skipping over a little bit, but the Geneva Bible was the Bible of the uh, Reformation. And it was brought on board by the pilgrims and brought to the New World. Now, probably many of you have known this. I didn't know this until I started doing the research. The Geneva Bible is the Bible on which America was founded. The irony is most Protestant religions uh, use the King James Version, but that is based on 90% of this Geneva Bible. I thought that was rather interesting. Well, now we know we've had this mutiny is kind of brewing in the background and so forth. What helps or, or hinders, we have the great screw incident. And one day what happened to break this monotony, you hear crack. And the, of course they're saying, what's happening? Are we going to drown? Are we all going to die out here in the middle of this ocean? Well, fortunately, someone remembered that they, there was this tool. And they brought it up and they were able to uh, fix it so that the mast or the mast, I believe it is, was uh, made uh, stable and they were able to continue on their way. And so what happened here is, next we go to Land Ho. Finally, we're going to get someplace and all of this mutiny and whatever is uh, going to pass. So somebody says, of course, some, no one can tell us what to do. No one can command us. And others, of course, wanted to wait and be a little bit more cautious. But anyway, the, um, yeah, the powers that be said, in order to live safely in this new land, the pilgrim leaders knew they must all stay together. They must make some laws. And in the great cabin of the Mayflower, the pilgrims drew up an agreement called the Mayflower Compact. And that should be the next slide. And James Chilton, the father of Mary Chilton, signed this, but very few days afterwards, he died in Provincetown Harbor, and he never did get to set foot and the new world at all. So, and this supposedly tells us the legend of Mary Chilton. That's debatable, you know, there are, somebody has written a little story saying, well, that's possible. Well, it may be. Anyway, in, on December 11th, 1620, William Bradford and a group of men reached land, they had come to Plymouth. And was this the Plymouth Rock? Who knows? But anyway, uh, if you've seen it, you wonder, well, okay, what is it uh, like, little, or whatever. So, we're moving along, and do most of you know the legend of Mary Chilton. And now this is the common house. That's the first building completed and as we know, people have to live someplace, and they were on the ship, but they were also, many of them, uh, housed here until they could find their own homes. 26 days to complete. Captain Jones and his crew are saying, are we ever going to get out of here? Are we ever going to get home? And they were tired of uh, waiting for the pilgrims to continue working. They would stop Saturday. And then they would start again on uh, Monday. And then we come across the first winter. Mrs. Chilton died in this first winter. 
75% of the women died. And, let me see if I can remember, 50% of the men, 36% of the boys, only two girls. So you wonder how was it that Mary was able to survive? Well, somehow by perseverance, stamina, and I don't know what else, she did manage to survive. Uh, this is one of the chores, and I'll just briefly mention the uh, tradition of wash day. Uh, Captain Jones was in Provincetown Harbor, and the women and the children were here, and he said, you know what, must be time for you. Go ashore, you know, wash up, wash your clothes, or let the kids run around and whatever. So that happened on a Monday, and that supposedly is how the tradition of Monday became uh, wash day. But Mary Chilton now is an orphan, 13 years old. She has to do something to become a member of the community. You know, it's not a free ride. So she has to take care of maybe fetching water, watch it with children, help prepare food. Uh, and when they finally get to Plymouth, then she has to take care of the animals and, and so forth. So, and uh, very interesting, despite the fact that the pilgrims had experienced in Holland free enterprise. When they came to the New World, they decided they were going to try this agricultural uh, experiment, agricultural socialism. It almost wiped out the whole community because not everybody was contributing to this. So in 1623, Mary is given three plots of land. She is now 16 years old, pretty wealthy woman to have three lots. And land, of course, where women owned was unusual. And that's another unusual thing about the Plymouth settlement, was that they were able, the women, uh, to own land. And we come across our first Thanksgiving, and it is not football games and pumpkin pie and all of, all of that, what you are uh, used to. Uh, there were, I believe, 90 people that Massasoit brought, but he also went out and got some deer and so forth. Um, I have somewhere recipes, if anyone is ever interested, that um, talk about the first Thanksgiving. The, reason that the Thanksgiving was uh, included was because of a healthy harvest and survival and hope of good fortune. Our harvest being gathered in, the governor sent four men fowling, that means, you know, look, looking, hunting for birds. So we might, after special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruits of our labors. 53 pilgrims, four married women, five adolescent girls, including Mary Chilton. She probably had to pitch in and help. Nine adolescent boys, 13 young children, and 22 men. This is John and uh, Mary. I think I'm probably running a little bit over. Sorry about that quickly. Uh, John came on the fortune which was a ship that brought 35 more people. They came with nothing, a few sorry things. So anyway, here we are. We have John and Mary getting married, uh, then moving to Boston and so forth. I would like to read quickly, and I apologize for going a little bit over here. <laughs> In the, this plaque is in an alley in Boston, and it says, Mary Chilton, the only Mayflower passenger who removed from Plymouth to Boston, died here in 1679. John Winslow and Mary Chilton were married in Plymouth about 1624, came to Boston about 1657, bought a house on this site in 1671. 
John Winslow died here in 1674. As a passenger on the Mayflower in 1620, Mary Chilton came to America before any other white woman who settled in Boston. And the gravestones are at King's Chapel burying ground. The end, and I'm sure you're breathing a sigh of relief. 